is Manny Barbosa. Welcome to my channel. So again, for those who are new in my channel, um, I am an ICU nurse educator and I have been a nurse for many years, about 30 years in the ICU. We always say that because some people, you know, just in case you have that implicit biases. Um, because we do believe about Dr. Benner, but you know, Patricia Benner, novice to expert theory, right? So if you're thinking about being an expert, a five-year nurse cannot be an expert. I think we need to get credit or give credit to those nurses who've been a nurse for a while and work in the ICU for a while. However, there is no correlation of the years of experience in terms of being an expert, real expert, because what really makes you an expert is if you put the theory and your practice together. We call that critical thinking, that you must understand what you're doing and how we, why are you doing it that way. So it's more so of the why and the how. If I have to ask you why are you why are we doing it this way, you should be able to articulate that to me and how. Okay. For example, simple things as why are we bolusing normal saline one liter to our hypotensive patient? If you're just telling me that oh it's just to augment volume, but my next question to you is how? Right? So if you don't know how then that's something that you probably need to learn more because a good nurse should be able to articulate that. So if I'm a new nurse and I ask you, you're my preceptor, then you should have you should be able to guide me with understanding that because the more that we understand what we do, the more that we advocate for our patient's safety. Remember, you are at the bedside you are the eyes the ears of your patient right and then you're calling the doctor if your data is not sufficient or it's not good enough to paint a picture you know if you're calling the doctor and you're missing a lot of data in there um, you're either under or over treating your patient I, and I kept saying that a lot in my classes because that's the reality of what we do. We do have some nurses who are actively involved with the care, and we do have ICU nurses who are passively involved with the care. So those are the nurses that I think, that I think, that just waiting for the doctor to read their EKG, that they're just waiting for the doctor's order, that they're really just waiting for the doctor to make the decision. Okay, and that's not a good ICU nurse. So a good ICU nurse, if you're able to A, figure out what the data in front of you, you can able to analyze and synthesize them and say, I'm gonna call the doctor. B is when you're calling the doctor, you use the S bar that you utilize your recommendation. What would be your recommendation? Because I don't know what's happening at the bedside. You know, if the doctor is if the doctor is at home one in the morning he probably don't have any idea what you're talking about, okay? So those are the things that I highly emphasize in in becoming more, uh, you know, um, subject matter expert in the ICU. First, we're here to discuss hemodynamic monitoring. Again, as I've said, there's so many nurses out there that works in the ICU that have been working in the ICU, but to tell you honestly they might not or you know many years ago when I was working at the bedside they remove a lot of our nurse educator they replace them with some online either health stream you know and no one really told us how to do this and why are we doing it this way but for me because I got my ICU training with didactic when you say didactic, we had conceptualized theory. It's like reviewing your CCRN, so to speak, but it's more of like an in-depth training. So uh, that's what we do now in my ICU, that everybody comes to the door, even if you're experienced or novice ICU nurse, we're still going to test you or, you know, it include you to this didactic um, training. All right, 
So before we start diving in or discussing about hemodynamics monitoring, I want you to understand what is a cardiac cycle. What is really the cardiac cycle? So we all know that cardiac cycle has one systole and one diastole, okay? So to make it more like a complete um, contracting and relaxation of your heart. So um, here you see the atrial contraction is what we normally say happen first um, because when we continue this discussion towards the end you'll find out that you know um the atria will eventually open up passively and give you that um 80 percent of the blood that sits in the atria will passively flow to the ventricle but let all let's all gonna discuss about the atrial contraction first so as i've mentioned here atrial contraction is when your atria contracts, you'll give that 20% atrial kick, right? And we call that preload. So um, what if your patient don't have um, that atrial kick anymore? In the case of AFib, for example, then you probably will lose that 20% atrial kick. So what happened here is understanding the cardiac cycle, you have to think there's three chambers Okay, so the atria, the ventricle, and then the aorta. What would be the relationship when, you know, during this event or any, uh, or, you know, in each phase of the cardiac cycle? When the atria contracts or the atrial contracts, there is an opening. So there is a relationship between what we call your atria and your ventricle right however your ventricle and your aorta probably don't have any relationship yet because the aorta is close it, it has its own pressure in there and it's not connected to anything right now okay so there's a relationship between your atria and your ventricle when the ventricle will reach a certain pressure so from zero here and then it became five and then you just dump those blood in there so now the pressure is higher than the atria but it's lower than the aorta you're going to close this what we call the mitral valve so when the mitral valve closes and the ventricle is, try, is starting to contract it's contracting in a closed chamber and we call that isovolumetric contraction that's where you hear your s1 so your s1 is that lub lub okay lub dub lub dub so s1 is lub um it's basically think about that ventricle contracting as a closed chamber and that pressure creates the mitral valve on the left side tricuspid valve on the right side to close and create that s1 so when the pressure continues to go up into the ventricle uh, overcoming the pressure into the aorta let's say your pressure here is 81 and now your pressure here is about it's going up okay so it's about it's about like one above 81 so let's just say 85 so in that case the, the ventricle will continue to contract and there is what we call a rapid ventricular ejection phase so that rapid rapid ventricular ejection phase will makes the aorta to expand and that's the beauty of the aorta it's because it can accommodate large amount or you know, volume of blood coming from the left ventricle so the pressure is greater into the aorta and eventually what's going to happen is that the pressure will start to slow down and when the slowing down of ventricular ejection phase 
the pressure into the vent, uh, aorta now it's going down and at the same time the pressure into the ventricle is also going to go down so from 85 120 and then it's now becoming 110 and then it continue to go down to like um 80 so now you're below the aortic pressure or aorta yeah pressure in the aorta then eventually the aortic valve and pulmonic valve will close right when that close closes or when this these valves will close then what happened is there is what we call the relaxation of the ventricle so when the ventricle relaxes it will produce that S2 sound so that S2 sound is from the closure of I mentioned a while ago your aortic valve and the tri tricuspid valve okay and then it will continue to relax however before we move to this next phase I want you to understand what do you think is uh, the three chambers doing and also what do you think is happening with your CBP okay so here as I mentioned a while ago when your atria contracts your CBP will give you an A wave right and when you have an isovolumetric contraction it, and I, we say that your mitral valve and your tricuspid valve closes it gives you that C wave okay and we say here that the ventricle empties the blood into the aorta rapidly then you kind of empty the you know the aorta the ventricle so you see a dip into the CBP trace okay so now I want you guys to focus on when the mitral valve is closed same way the tricuspid valve is closed the left atria will now serve as a tank because think about your lungs your lungs as a pulmonary veins in there there are like four pulmonary veins two on the left and two on the right there's no valves into the pulmonary veins that continuously flowing blood into the left atria so therefore your left atria becomes a conduit no a tank a tank same way here the inferior vena cava superior vena cava will fill in blood into the right atrium okay so think about this as a you know another set of concept that you need to add you know when you're thinking about your cardiac cycle so now the as we move on to these phases as soon as the isovolumetric relaxation phase occur your atria is again a tank and it will continue to fill from the lungs once you feel that the atria is already filled with blood you see a V wave okay so your V wave is telling you that the atrial fill there is that atrial filling okay and then um, there is an opening of the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve because now the pressure is so high in here and you just drop the pressure into the ventricles so it will open passively okay because of that pressure so there's no contraction yet it just open passively because of the gradient pressure is lower in the ventricle okay so when that happened guys you see a Y descent that is like emptying your uh, your atria passively and it will slow down that's what we call diastasis 
so i hope that you understand this again guys it's just giving you an idea that these three chambers your atria your ventricle and your aorta um i'm t focusing on the left side it's happening like you know um phases and that is the systole and the diastolic phase when you're contracting and when you're relaxing okay so again when your atrial contraction that's 20 percent of your cardiac or your preload your atrial kick will add it into the 80 percent that just passively fill into the ventricle and that gives you the a wave from the cbp and when the ventricle is starting to contract and the pressure is building up but it's not too high to open the aortic valve it will contract as a closed chamber that is your isovolumetric contraction right and it create your s1 and then when the pressure into the ventricle is higher than the aorta it will open that valve aortic valve blood will just rapidly flowing into the aorta with the amount of pressure that the ventricle is contracting is doing it will just gonna engorge that aorta filling up blood from the left ventricle and then of course that will slow down and when you see that happening you see your x descent the x descent into your cbp and then the atria will continue as a tank okay it will continue functioning as a tank blood coming from the right and the left lungs right that drains into the pulmonary vein pulmonary vein has four you don't have any valves in there so it's continuously flowing and it's filling up the atria and once that pressure is building up and the, it decreases the pressure into the ventricle it will just gonna open that mitral valve and dump 80 percent of the blood that sits into the uh to the left atria same way in the right vent right atria and then of course that's what we call the y descent all right so that is your cardiac cycle so again this is just um, an extra slide to recap what we just mentioned so what is hemodynamic so hemodynamic is a when the heart generates pressure and tension does your blood ejected through the cardiovascular system and either there are a way to monitor it is intermittent or continuous um, some of the hospitals they have those cardiac output continuous cardiac output when you put a PA catheter and it continuously monitoring your cardiac output or even the SVO2 because it's designed that way but if you don't have that and you only have the um, the capability to do it like you know independent cardiac output where you inject an injectate saline and then you you play with your monitor it's still okay and then you put in all your numbers and then you do your hemodynamic calculation and it gives you the cardiac output cardiac index inc well it will give you the svr you know systolic systemic vascular resistance and i will help you on how to remember the um, not remember but to understand the formula of systemic vascular resistance and also to understand the formula of pulmonary vascular resistance okay so there will be a video that you're going to watch that you're going to see how the doctor put in the pa catheter okay so i will add the video in here and then we'll jump in again after the video we're using oxymetric swans, so they have to be light calibrated first. The regular swan doesn't. So what we'll do is the perfusionists are going to connect it up. So what we do is we open it, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll throw it off the end that they need. And basically what will happen is everything to, the, to my right will be, quote, contaminated. But everything to the left won't be. So they'll touch that end, and we'll... we'll um, do the light cal. Now, if you have a regular swan, you don't have to do this phase. You just can pull it out. The whole purpose of this is the tip is in the dark, so it zeroes, it zeroes the sac. If you don't do it, you can draw a PA gas later on and enter it manually. 
uh, or if the, the, the cow fails or whatever, or, or something happens or you change to the ICU and you don't take the cable and that's what they do, but they don't, they don't, it doesn't save the data. It takes about 20 seconds. Now when you come out, you don't want to contaminate this. There's a contamination shield. So you rip it off. Now if you look at the contamination shield, it has two pieces. There's one piece, this little T-groove goes and it fits to the, there's a little nub here on the catheter and that locks it. And it also has a proximal, two other pieces where you can lock the swan so it doesn't move on the swan. So first of all, you want to put it in and make sure you put it in this way, not this way. And don't open the bag. Just put it through and then when you get there, you don't want to contaminate it. You pull it all up. Each mark on the swan is 10. The fat mark is 50. So you pull it up to near the end. It doesn't have to go all the way up to the top, maybe 80, 75. And you take it and you lock it. See, now the swan can't move. Now, what we do here is we give you a, uh, an Alice clamp so you can clamp this down. And when you do this, don't clamp the swan so it won't slide off. So this is kind of all contaminated, but this isn't. Now, these swans, there's a PA port. There's two CVP ports, the white one, kind of the VIP port, and the CVP, so they all have to be flushed. These oximetric swans all uh, have a heat coil, so you don't have to do injectate. And it, what it does is it obscures the 20 mark. The 20 mark, if you look closely, you can see it, but it's in, the, it's in this coil. This is the heat generating coil. And you check the balloon. You want to make sure that the balloon a comes up, B, that it doesn't inflate eccentrically, that it covers the tip. So it seems like it works. So you put it in, you hold your hand here, and you kind of maybe try to get the natural curve of the heart. And well, before you put up the balloon, you go in about 20 centimeters, and you should be in the right atrium. And you're going to, of course, use the EKG uh, monitor to uh, look at the waveform. So in balloon up. And what you do is you advance it with the heartbeat, one to three beats, and you be cognizant of how far you're going in, because it should be the 30, 35 if you cross the tricuspid valve. Otherwise, you can get a loop, and when you get a loop, you can get a knot, and it's happened to me a few times, so you gotta, you know, be careful. You just can't keep on inserting it forever. So you insert it, and let's hopefully by 30, 35, see, now, you may not see the monitor, but it's in the R, V and it's at 29 or so. So same with the swan. Keep going. Now sometimes here you get a little ectopy and usually you can work your way through it. Once in a while the patient fibrillates very rarely, then you've got to defibrillate. Otherwise, then, but you do usually get a lot of ectopy and now you see I'm in the PA. Well, you may not be able to see the monitor in about 42. We don't uh, wedge the catheter. We've had a PA rupture and we don't need to do it. So we just leave it here. At this point, balloon down. You move the bag, the contamination shield, and move it so that the excess is all the way down um, close to the body. This way later on, and we don't lock it because what we like to do when they manipulate the heart, the swan can move. So when we, before we go on bypass, we pull it back. Now again, so we're not going to lock it with the locking, but the distal part has that little T piece that goes in the nub and you tighten it. And now, if the shield is locked on, but it's not locked, the swan can still move. If you turn this piece, the swan is locked and it can't move. So we don't do that. We keep it open. So we can pull it. And now we're done. Uh, and we'll put our little dressing on it. And at the end of the case, we'll put a nice dressing on, but for now. And, uh... Okay. So you just watched the video on how the doctor in the operating room put in the PA catheter. That video is a little bit long but I cut it in I cut it short and thank you YouTube for providing us that video for that we could use to educate our staff. So as you may have remembered what the doctor told us in the video that they you as a nurse you will help them. They'll give it to you they consider not sterile anymore, you flush them, you connect your pressure bag, your CBP blue to blue, your PA cardiac, your PA pulmonary artery pressure, yellow to yellow with your yellow bag, you know, yellow um, transducer. And then you, once you flush, the doctor is aware that you flush them, so there's no air in the system. And then you 
help the doctor to inflate the balloon, right? So just like what he said, at the 20 centimeters mark, you inflate the balloon because that's where you definitely at the CBP or right atrium area. But then make sure that you do it slowly. The doctor will do it slowly watching the monitor for any kind of arrhythmia. So once you get into the right ventricle, right ventricle doesn't like having any catheter in there, it will kind of give you a right ventricle PVC. So I always tell them how does right ventricle PVC look like? It's a wide R, wide R and then it goes down like that. So if you see a wide R in V1, then that is giving you a right PVC, okay? Again, guys, I don't know if you know this, but just in case you haven't heard it, it's okay. That's why you're watching this video for you to be able to learn, right? But definitely when you look at your V1, not lead 2, V1, you will see a wide R. And that is an indicative of right ventricle PVC. Okay, so this is what the advanced hemodynamics looks like as what the video have presented. So if you are on number one, that is your right atrium, you'll see a CBP tracing. And we just mentioned that in uh, not too long ago, when you have a CBP is A, C, X, V, and Y. Okay, A, C, V, this is your X descent and this is your Y descent and then it goes to the right ventricle and there's no dichrotic notch in your right ventricle so that's where uh, that's what you're gonna tell the doctor if they're not looking at the monitor and you're the one who's looking at the monitor you see the right ventricle doesn't have any dichrotic notch and as soon as you pass that pulmon pulmonic valve then you'll see on the monitor your dichrotic notch here Okay, you should have a dichrotic notch and then it will advance until it's occluding the pulmonary artery because the balloon is still inflated then you see like a CBP like you know read a uh, trace again when you see like a CBP like trace we call that wedge or PAOP pulmonary artery occlusive pressure and the doctor might say, can you deflate the balloon? Normally you deflate the balloon, they'll pull it back and they will ask you again to inflate the balloon. So again, it all depends on the style of the doctors who's putting in the, the balloon. So they do it twice sometimes just to make sure that they're in the right place. And then once you see your PAOP or your pulmonary artery occlusive pressure trace, then you tell the doctor you are in the right place. So what is PAOP means to you when you're occluding the artery, there's no blood flow coming in. You're pretty much looking at the left side of the heart in a very normal mitral valve state. If your mitral valve is normal, once that mitral valve open, then you can pretty much see in the left ventricle and diastolic pressure. Yeah. So meaning your PAOP is also a measurement of your left ventricle and diastolic pressure. Alright, so we're going to move on to how does your PA catheter look like or it looks like. Remember what the doctor said on the video, you have those markings and each uh, thin mark is 10 centimeters and if you see a very fat you know mark in there that's 50 okay why is it so important to know well because you need to report how much is the catheter from the outside to the inside right so if you're looking at let's say one big bar and a small bar next to it so that is 60 50 plus 10 is 60 centimeters that's what you're gonna tell your when you're giving report right and make sure guys that you need to familiarize what catheter PA catheter you guys are using because there's a lot out there there's a um, the Vigileo um, SVO2 monitoring in there that you need to recalibrate in vivo or um, 
in vivo is within or you know outside so it all depends if you don't have that then it's okay you don't have to I'm just giving you guys an idea because you might see an extra port okay so over here this is your time store thermistor for your kachak output and then is your proximal proximal means closer so that is your CBP distal means far so it's probably here um, and that is your PAOP so if you're gonna ask me hey where will I draw my SVO2 so SVO2 you draw it into the distal right the yellow and if you're if your doctor said well I don't really like SV I want SCVO2 so it's pretty much like the central line so I don't know I don't know if you guys are doing that but some hospital is doing that they go for SCVO2 rather than SVO2 then this is where you're gonna draw your SCVO2 so clarify that guys because I would rather go for SVO2 if I have a PA catheter right why would I go for SCVO2 I will only do SCVO2 if I don't have a PA catheter if I'm only using a regular central line well correct me if I'm wrong but that's what we've, we've been doing in the ICU again this is what I was telling you guys there is this optical module connector for your machine like the Vigileo machine SVO2 machine okay look you have more here and this is your thermal filament connector for your um, you know different type of machine again that you have that you might have as an extra at the bedside if you don't have this and you only have this it's okay alright so this is just for for FYI so once I want you to understand this concept because it is imperative that you understand so if I'm gonna say what would be your preload from the right side so right side preload is what we call CVP okay and then your left side preload will be what you just did here you occluded this area here or even in that area I should say I'm sorry you occluded this area here so now the pressure in here out, you know just before the left atria is your PAOP okay so that is your wedge if you're gonna ask me well my hospital is not doing wedge or occluding the artery pulmonary artery what can I use so then you can use your we call it the pulmonary artery pressure diastolic okay you have your systolic and you have your diastolic let's say your systolic is 30 and your diastolic is 15 okay so normally your pad is a little bit higher than your PAOP like three or four difference so more or less you might have about 11 or 12 here so 10 to 12 reflection of your PAOP so don't use like don't say 15 because if there is an equalization of your pad and your PAOP then that is a different condition usually cardiac tamponade right so that's just FYI but definitely a good hospital some of the big medical center they like we normally um, do a wedge PAOP why based on my experience it's kind of hard to blame the lungs when the condition is not related to the lungs in itself it also the left side of the heart can be blamed and that's what we called some of our pulmonary hypertension pulmonary edema with cardiogenic involvement or with, or with cardiac involvement when you, when I say that is let's say you wedge let's say you're allowed to wedge because I know some of the doctors nowadays they don't let the nurses wedge for some reason I don't know 
but during my time or even when I was working at the bedside we still wedge so I guess it's an institutional policy because they're trying to avoid pulmonary artery rupture because if you do it wrong yeah you'll rupture but if you're doing it right then of course you won't rupture but again guys FYI one of the contraindication of not putting a PA catheter is when no one knows how to use it because you don't want to you know for patient safety as what they always say but let's go back so if I wedge here and my PAOP is 8 because the normal is 8 to 12 within this range and if my PAP pulmonary artery pressure are elevated let's say 40 over 35 okay well this condition is considered as pulmonary artery you know pulmonary artery pressure increase so you expect your pulmonary vascular resistance goes up in there however we would like to know is the cause of this pulmonary uh, artery pressure or increase in pulmonary artery pressure caused by the left atria or left ventricle you know the left side but if your PAOP is within normal then he did not cause that he did not give you that problem okay so that's one thing that we that we normally likes to do with wedging with PAOP so that we can elicit you know there's a differential diagnosis in there that you could say hey I just did a wedge it was okay so it wasn't the left side of the heart to be blamed okay so again that's just FYI and when you're looking at your right side afterload which is your pulmonary vascular resistance and your left side afterload which is your systemic vascular resistance so anything that comes out or let's just continue it over there okay so this is your SVR here and this is your PVR here your pulmonary vascular resistance I want you to remember when you're dealing with pulmonary vascular resistance that you need to understand there is this what, what I call pulmonary artery mean. So your PA systolic, PA diastolic, you have a pulmonary artery mean pressure, right? So normally it's 15. So PVR is your PA mean, okay? you minus that with your PAOP here so PAOP okay and you divide that with cardiac output okay so whatever comes in whatever went in you know I mean whatever cardiac output let's say five liters came in five liters were gonna come out in your heart okay so that's why we always kind of how do you get your cardiac output? Well, again, it's an extra, you know, it's an extra process where you inject saline, you look for a good curb, bell curb, those kind of things. And then you will try it three times, get the median, and then you calculate your, your um, hemodynamics calculation. Okay, so that's 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 when you you get your cardiac output, and you multiply it by eighty. Again, pulmonary vascular resistance is the measurement of your pulmonary artery pressure mean. You minus that with your PAOP here, and you divide it by cardiac output, and you multiply it by eighty. That is your pulmonary vascular resistance right so at least you understand that this is the this is what we do in the ICU then your SVR once your systemic vascular resistance comes out the blood comes out from the left ventricle you need to understand that this is your blood pressure now this is your mean arterial pressure okay so we need to have a very good mean arterial pressure because outside your system in the systemic 
you have a lot of pressure in here you have the arterioles that likes to constrict you have a lot of alpha in there you know arterioles and then it goes to the capillaries okay and then it will bypasses those pressures that are you know certain organs they have their own pressure for example um your heart the myocardium have a five millimeters of mercury pressure there the the the, the arteries that goes to the brain it has about 15 millimeters of mercury the ones that goes to the gi tract it has about 20 millimeters of mercury this kind of things and the highest pressure is the kidney you have about let's just say 30 millimeters of mercury there so if you have a map of let's say blood pressure is 120 over 80 so you're giving me a 93 map so 93 millimeters of mercury can overcome that pressure in the arterioles passing the capillary and then once they go to the venules that is a lesser pressure let's just say 10 millimeters of mercury and then it goes back to the left side or right side of the heart so in the right side of the heart we normally say that this should have a zero gradient so there's not pre no pressure in there to go against so that it's easier to just dump the blood from the left side to the right side right so um so therefore, your systemic vascular resistance, when you're thinking about your SVR, think about as your, think about your SVR, as I've mentioned here, sorry guys, so as your SVR is going to give you a mean arterial pressure, you minus that with your CBP, and you divide it by your cardiac output and then you multiply it by 80 right so it makes more sense that your systemic vascular resistance is requiring a higher pressure because it needs to overcome the pressure down there in the arterioles uh, wherein you find a lot of alpha there and we all know what alpha do to you they constrict you also find a beta 2 somewhere there like in the musculoskeletal where they dilate okay so therefore your SVR is a mean arterial pressure you minus it with CBP you divide it by cardiac output and you multiply it by 80 that is your SVR so when you review it guys again let's review this so what we just discussed there is that um, we discussed about um, right-sided PVR. Okay, no, I'm sorry, preload. Okay, so your preload um, on the right side is your CBP. On the left side is your PAOP wedge and CBP and then your after load okay so after load here your right side after the right ventricle it will go to the lungs right so that is your pulmonary vascular resistance and we say that your PVR pulmonary vascular resistance your PA mean minus your PAOP okay that's your wedge you divide by cardiac output and you multiply it by 80 makes sense right and then your systemic vascular resistance is your blood pressure so your mean arterial blood pressure mean arterial pressure minus your CBP we say zero well you can use whatever CBP measurement you have there and cardiac output and you multiply it by eight zero so that is your preload and that is your after load um 
Also, I want you to understand that your cardiac output is what we call the measurement of blood that's being ejected every minute from your left ventricle, right? So it is uh, dependent on your heart rate times your stroke volume. I want you to remember that some of our patients in ICU, their heart rate fluctuates, right? So then they said, why don't you include rhythm here too? Because what if my rate is really irregular and it's fast and it fluctuates? So again, guys, if you have a lot of numbers, it varies from 80, 60, 120, 150, back to 90. Probably you get the median. Okay, see where it, see where the sweet spot in there. And then you put it in because it's not sustaining 120 all the time, right? So it's not fair for you to be putting 120 in there because at one point it's dropping to 60 or 70, right? So you have to, you have to, that's what we call critical thinking. Again, you might be over or under treating your patient, but definitely we would require for you to look at your rhythm, okay? And then your stroke volume, be very careful because the stroke volume is the way I explain it. It's like you have your end diastolic volume. You minus that with end systolic volume. Okay, so what do I mean by end diastolic volume and end systolic volume? Let's say you have a cup here. Okay, so diastole is filling in. So diastole is you fill in. Okay, so whatever the blood gets into the left and right ventricle at the end of the um, the yastuli. so let's say at the end of the feeling phase so if you have a total of 120 ml and then the blood squeeze out so that's your systole okay so you squeeze it out and this is your end systolic volume if there's like 50 ml left in the ventricle then 120 minus 50 it's giving you is it 70 so it's giving you a 70 ml of a stroke volume so 70 ml is your stroke volume in there so this is also since we're already talking about this don't forget your ejection fraction well what will i do how do i know that well ef then is your stroke volume which is your 70 you divide it by your end diastolic volume which is your 120 so 70 divided by 120 and it's going to give you um, at least 53 percent or something so that is your ef okay so whatever your um the result so hold on guys just to make sure so 70 divided by 120 and it's giving me a 58 ef so 0.58 okay so then that's how you do it all right so i'm hoping that you guys did not forget that because it's really important to understand it okay so that is your cardiac output based off your heart rate and stroke volume um one thing that i want you to understand too is do you do this your square wave test why if you do this in the morning before you start working or after you got report you know you're coming in you got report um, you let the night nurse know go you know you let them go home I should say what I want you to understand is that you should be um, checking your square wave so again guys um, this is your normal waveform you should have that square wave in here and then it will oscillate a few times and your number whatever you did here 
your number will be accurate based off you put it on the plevostatic axis on the fourth intercostal mid axillary right so why do we do that why are we zeroing it over there well basically we're zeroing it into the fourth intercostal mid axillary it's just to give us a point reference on the left atria right or on that left side i think it's on the left atria um and of course guys when you're turning your patient like to their lateral side it's or you're putting them on 30 degrees 90 degrees 45 degrees there's a lot of literature out there that says you just have to move them a little bit like if you're turning me to my right lateral right so now i'm on my side so definitely there's just a movement slight movement into my sternum where you need to uh, zero it over there okay you don't have to really put me flat again because you need to turn me at one point right so um, that's something that um, you know we do at the bedside and if your numbers are bad because you're either over damped or under damp well look at it troubleshoot it because sometimes your system might have some air bubbles in it or it's just too long you know if you don't need an extra tubings so sometimes they come from the OR and they put a lot of tubings in there so get rid of those extra tubings that you don't need so you just have to stick to what the the catheter that comes from the pack you know from the packet I should say so this is what you see guys on the monitor right so let's say this is your heart rate here look you have a p wave qrs's p wave qrs's so you have normal sinus rhythm and this is your o2 sat and look at your um art line here you have a good dichrotic notch there and look at your pap so this is what i was referring a while ago like what is a pulmonary artery pressure so you have 26 over 10 it's perfect the number is good the, the lower the number the better actually so and then don't blame the heart the lungs they're good and this is your mean so when you're thinking about your pvr pulmonary vascular resistance so this is number 15 is your mean of your pulmonary artery and depending on how much the cardiac output let's say your cardiac output here is 10 that's high <laughs> I'm just guessing guys but this is where you see your cardiac output here okay so again um, what you're missing here is the CBP so some monitors will give you an extra um, window that you need to add to get your CBP all right your central venous pressure so um, again guys I want you to make sure that you pay attention to your hemodynamics so the CBP nowadays is not being a very reliable um, I mean I'm not using it per se just to rely on volume um, because CBP can actually just tell us that there are a good representation of the fluids on the upper part of your body but what about the lower part of your body you know like for example um you know are you really volume um depleted or is your volume adequate you know so it's kind of hard so that's why i always say if you bolus your patient and you want to know if your treatment is effective ask somebody to get the ultrasound or echo and go and go for your ivc your inferior vena cava you know like when they do the when they're checking the vena, uh, inferior vena cava for so what I've learned over the years that I've been an ICU nurse if the inferior vena cava is not um, how do you call that like um, oh boy infarction so the IVC is a good indication of fluid responsiveness because if you could keep the size of your inferior vena, vena cava and they're not uh, collapsing this is a when when they when you see them when you see your IVC collapsing the volume is not enough okay 
but if the IVC remains inflate inflated because you're using the ultrasound machine you ask somebody to check it for you if you don't know how to check it and that's when you say that fluid is actually I mean sufficient in my own opinion okay um, that's what we normally do in the ICU that I used to work um, the, either the intern will get the machine or our hospitalist will get the machine and then they look for it because I normally just don't use my blood pressure as my parameter or CBP as my parameter that my intervention was effective because what over the years that I've been working in the ICU you give them one liter of fluid you bolus them after an hour they go back again to like you know blood pressure is dropping and you keep going up with your basoactive meds right your pressor so please guys that's what we mention all the time look at your tank they have enough volume so the only way to be more precise as far as I'm concerned as a nurse is I go for IVC okay so inferior vena cava if your inferior vena cava remains um, inflated not inflated but they're not collapsing same size that means you have good volume if they're collapsing when you're looking at you using your your ultrasound it's telling you the volume is not enough give more all right so this was all the things that I was telling you like when you're moving your patient to like 30 degrees 45 degrees you don't have to re-zero it again as long as you zero it on the plebostatic axis okay and then you can just move them up and down okay so what would be your practice where do you put your transducer I've seen some hospitals they're rolling towels and then they're taping it they're putting it there and when the patient drools because you turn them to the right it contaminate the transducer right so don't do that put them separately like by your you know hang them on the pole uh, IB pole there is a clip in there where the transducer needs to stay so use that okay so again this is again what we discussed a while ago I'm giving you a rundown again on the stroke volume so your preload Mm, your preload, your CBP, and your PAOP. Afterload is your PVR and SVR. Contractility is usually your right ventricle work stroke work index, left ventricle stroke work index, or pretty much, you know, your. Yeah, that's what we're using. And then it comes to your cardiac output here. All right, so this is a repetition of what we mentioned a while ago and in the video, okay, right ventricle, and it sits there. So this is what I was referring you guys. So this is really important. Again, that's the that's one thing that we would like for you to wedge because if you are seeing your tracing as like big M, let's just say this is what you normally see, right? but you lose this you kind of lose that and now you're seeing a letter M or so sometimes this is a uh, I don't know why it looks like this in here but normally what we see is this is a little bit more closer here you compress this a little bit so it become like that okay like that so if you're losing this and it become like that so normally you should have a y descent here if you lose that y descent and your tracing becomes like a letter m then there's some condition that needs the attention of the doctor for example uh, popular muscle rupture you know those kind of things or um, regurgitation stenosis those kind of things again but definitely the big part there is your popular muscle ruptured so if you see a letter M let the doctor know
okay so again if you're not wedging how do you know that so that's the only time we had the opportunity to check our wedge okay so when we run when we do wedge we we froze the screen and then we will uh, print and then we manually look at it and read the trace okay so that's what I was telling you guys all right so this is what I was mentioning a while ago that from here to here it's pretty much your SVR your systemic vascular and then the, if there's a resistance in here because of the arterioles you know in the capillaries and then it goes to the venules the less pressure it goes back to the right side all right so again here is your mean arterial pressure okay minus your CBP here you divide it by cardiac output and you multiply it by eight zero, right? So your normal is normally again it all depends. So some books would say eight hundred to twelve hundred. Okay. Um so the higher the number the worse because if it's too high, it's too tight. If the number is too low, there are too loose. So that's just again a reminder for you. If your number SVR, PVR are too high, it means too tight, constricted. If the number is low, they're too loose. So probably a lot of histamines in there, why they're vasodilating. So when they're too tight, your medication is vasodilator. Okay, so you have those nitroglycerin. Venus, venous vasodilator is your nitro. Your arterial vasodilator is your probably hydralazine, you know, those kind of things. So think about that. Think about that. And then your um, if their two number is too low, they're too loose. Sepsis, probably. Um, anaphylactic shock, probably. Then you want to constrict them what would be your medication to constrict them your libofed your beta 1 your beta 2 your epinephrine your beta 1 alpha 1 you know those kind of things so a combination of alpha constrictor on the vessels only beta 1 is like they really use the heart muscle okay um, and then your beta 2 is for your to relax so usually alpha and beta Okay, and beta one. So um, I'm hoping that you guys understand the hemodynamics. Um, that's pretty much what I have for you today. And if you have any question, let me know if you're working in my hospital. And if not, um, then, you know, till the next video again. Thank you.